Uh, well, thank you, everyone. So what I thought I'd like to do is um, start at the beginning as an assistant professor at Caltech when uh, I'd been at NIH for three years and had a chance kind of learn how to do science and manage a lab and everything. But at Caltech, I had the chance to really rethink what I wanted to do. I was at that time, uh, as you heard, a molecular immunologist. And it was an unbelievably exciting field at that uh, point in time. But when I went to Caltech, um, it was really clear to me that complexity in immunity was an enormously staggering problem. And in fact, the problem that I chose, antibody diversity, was absolutely a trivial problem by comparison. Because you could look at proteins first and make inferences and later at nucleic acids. And, and we figured out a lot of the fundamental mechanisms that were responsible for diversity. But when you started thinking about what an immune response was, uh, what tolerance was, what autoimmunity were, it, it, you know, it, was, uh, it was very much like the uh, fable of the elephant and six blind men, each feeling a different part of the elephant and saying, it is a uh, spear or a trunk or whatever. And, and so it was with a complex system uh, like biology. And, it, and it was really clear that the tools of molecular and cellular biology at the time were utterly inadequate to, to attack those big problems in immunology. And I remember reading in something like 1972 or 73, a book by Thomas Kuhn on the structure of scientific revolution. And what it talked about were paradigm changes in physics. And it's, a, it's absolutely a marvelous book. You ought to read it if you get the chance. And, and what that book said was two things. One, if you're to really create a new paradigm change, it's really difficult because you have to think outside the box. And none of us, most of us, are not very good at thinking outside the box. But two, he warned, even if you could think out of the box and come up with some new things, it could be a long road to that paradigm change because most scientists are enormously conservative. So anyway, uh, with that in mind, I started thinking about you know, what, what kind of tools at the time could be useful for uh, attacking some of the harder problems in immunology. And it was just exactly what Ellen said, biology driving the nature of the uh, technology development. And in the period I was at Caltech, then we developed the uh, four instruments, the DNA and protein synthesizers and sequencers. And, uh, and, and the reason those four instruments were chosen was because if you had a protein sequencer that could sequence a very, very small amount of a protein, and if you had a and you determined the sequence, and you had a DNA synthesizer, you could get a probe, and you could use that to clone the gene. And once you had the gene, you could sequence it and make peptides to create antibodies. And in a sense, that whole circle closed very beautifully. And I remember writing a paper for Nature that talked about the hypothesis that you could complete this beautiful circle. Only the problem was there are a whole series of things that we hadn't done. So it took just about two and a half years to get that paper published in Nature. But it actually got published in more or less its, uh, its original form. But I will say one thing that I did learn is new technology, in part, is about exploring new dimensions in data space. And those new dimensions give you completely new insights into biology. And I'll tell you about one of the instruments, the uh, gas phase 
liquid uh, protein sequencer that, that Mike uh, Huckabiller really pioneered. So the essence of that instrument was it was two or 300 times more sensitive than uh, any other methods for sequencing proteins. So what it meant is we could take vanishingly small amounts of proteins uh, and sequence them, and then clone the genes and open up new things. And I'll tell you just about three examples that I think were really transformational. And I think one of the most interesting was sequencing the human growth hormone, platelet-derived growth factor. And when we sequenced it for about 15 or 20 residues, and this was something like 82 or 83, we did the first bioinformatics search that I know about of comparing that sequence to a very small number of pre-existing sequences. But what was really striking about that is it was absolutely identical to an avian oncogene uh, for 13 or 14 residues except for one substitution. And from that came the hypothesis that oncogenes were indeed uh, genes of normal growth and development that had been captured by viruses and employed to, uh, uh, to let them uh, replicate effectively. A second example is working with Stan Prussner uh, to sequence the prion protein. And the only way to purify the prion protein at that time was to take this horrible mixture of proteins from the brain of uh, infected animals, and then you digested them all with uh, uh, a protease. And the only thing that was left standing was the prion protein, except A, it was present in small quantities, and B, its end had been made ragged. So we sequenced that and uh, figured out the sequence, cloned the gene, and that, that really led to this hypothesis that uh, brain diseases are uh, caused by aggregation of proteins and, and a Nobel Prize for Stan in 1994, 95. And I would say the third area that was really spectacular was we had just started a company called Amgen and uh, the scientific advisory board thought that a really great project for Amgen would be to clone the gene for erythropoietin because it allowed you to do, deal with anemias. And, and well, normal anemias, the anemias that come from cancers and a variety of other things. And again, we had it in vanish in small quantities. And we did at Caltech succeed in sequencing this. And then that really opened up uh, the cloning of the gene for Amgen, and that was biotech's first billion dollar product. So those were three of 20 projects that we did that each opened up interesting new fields. And it was a great example of opening up new areas of data space and uh, seeing new kinds of things. So by the end of, um, by the end of the 70s, this uh, vision of putting this set of four instruments together was clear, and we'd kind of done the protein sequencer. Uh, we were really struggling with the, struggling with the DNA synthesizer, uh, and Lloyd Smith played a really pioneering role in that. Steve Kent had come to start working on the peptide uh, synthesizer with DNA synthesis. I remember I remember going to Marv Carruthers, who invented the absolutely critical chemistry uh, for DNA synthesis uh, in his lab at Colorado. And I said, look, we'd really like to automate this technology. Will you teach us this? And he said, oh, look, I can teach any idiot how to do DNA synthesis in less than a week. But he said, you're wasting your time. He said, uh, chemists can, can do this. You don't need to set up a machine. We're never, ever going to use lots and lots of oligonucleotides. So we had a big argument, but he taught it to us, and uh, we went from there. So the, so the next dimension of my career then came when 
I went to the president of Caltech and I said, look, I've got these set of instruments that we're developing and I'd really like to take them out and get them commercialized so other people uh, could use them. And then the president said to me, the role of an academic institution is scholarship and education. It isn't commercialization. And, and you know, I'd never really thought about that very much before, but it just crystallized for me the, my deep feelings are that every scientist has an obligation to transfer society their knowledge where it's useful. And I made that argument, and he was unconvinced. He said, OK, you uh, go out on your own. Caltech will have nothing to do with you uh, in this regard. So I went out to, I went out to, in the next year plus, 19 different instrument companies. And at the end, I was zero for 19. And I was, you know, I'm not inarticulate about these things. And I couldn't figure out why I couldn't get through. And there was a really good reason. And I'll tell you about that uh, in just a moment. But what happened then is Bill Bose, a uh, venture capitalist in San Francisco, called me and said, well, I hear you've been shopping these instruments around unsuccessfully. He says, look, I'll give you uh, $2 million, and let's start a company that uh, later became Applied Biosystems. And I said, great. And I went back to uh, Murph Goldberger. Murph Goldberger is a physicist, so he's never had any dealing with the real world, just so you understand him. <laughs> and uh, Murph Goldberger said to me, Venture capital money is dirty money. Caltech will never accept dirty money. So it was, you know, it was really frustrating. But after about six months, I finally persuaded him this was the only course of action we could do. And we were just about ready to sign the agreement for applied biosystems when, unfortunately, I gave a lecture to the Caltech trustees the chair of whom was Arnold Beckman of Beckman Instruments and so forth. And that was a company that I'd gone to three different times. And the third time, they said to me, we understand what you're selling. We're not interested. Don't come back again. So, so anyway, I gave this lecture about the vision of the four instruments and how it was going to change biology. And Arnold Beckman came running up to me. And he said, this is fantastic. This is just what uh, Beckman Spinko needs. And I said, well, I didn't think so. I'd gone there. And he said, impossible. So he flew up the next morning to these three people. And uh, so what they said to him is, Lee deceived us because he wanted to make a lot of money with the company, which was an utter lie. But it led to horrendous complications with Caltech and uh, Arnold Beckman. And, and I mean, actually, Applied Biosystems was an enormously successful company. I was the only scientific founder of Applied Biosystems. And the condition on which I could remain associated with it was I would take no equity whatsoever. And of course, I was really young and naive, and I agreed to that. And in the end, it didn't really matter at all anyway, because uh, applied systems get, did get started. But the two lessons I learned that were really critical is, well, actually, three lessons. Number one, you never go to mid-level people with new visions. You go to the very top people. And if they don't see it, then you're not going to get anyone in the company to see it. And with the 19 companies, I'd gone to these mid-level people. And it was, uh, and Arnold you know, saw it in a microsecond. Number two, it was really fortunate I didn't go to Arnold first, because none of those 19 companies would have put the resources or the talent into applied biosystems that we did uh, through the venture company. And of course, it became the number one company for many years in uh, molecular uh, instrumentation and everything. So um, anyway, uh, I will say I've, I've gone on to, to start now 16 uh, different companies, and only one has failed. Now, 
partly that's luck, but partly it's having this feeling for which things should you transfer that are necessary to uh, society and everything. So uh, vision one, uh, paradigm one, was bringing engineering to biology. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one more thing about that, which was very interesting. And when I went to Caltech, I talked to the chairman of biology and said I was going to have half my lab do molecular immunology and half my lab do instrumentation. He said, that's fine. But at three years, he came to me and said, I've come to advise you in the strongest possible terms to give up this instrumentation. And I said, no, I wouldn't do it. And then 25 years later, I asked him why he did that. And it was because all of the senior biologists at Caltech felt it was unseemly to have engineering in a biology department. And you know, that, that really was, it represented two interesting clashes. Because early on in biology, I'd said, look, let's hire some people that are chemists and that are engineers that can help do some of these kind of things. And they said, absolutely not. We're not interested in that kind of thing. And of course, what happened then is the technology part of my lab got very big because I had to hire the engineers and the chemists and the computer scientists and all to do all of that. And so there was this, you know, this constant clash with the other people at Caltech, even though we were developing all of these uh, great technologies. So the second paradigm change then came from one of the instruments, the automated sequencer that we developed because I got invited to the first meeting ever held in, in Santa Cruz on the Human Genome Project. And my old chair, Robert Sinsheimer, was then chancellor of Santa Cruz. And he was exploring in 85 the idea that maybe you could set a genome center up at Santa Cruz and sequence the human genome. So 12 of us got asked, 12 relevant people got asked to go and pass judgment on that idea. And we spent a day and a half. And it was utterly a fascinating discussion. And we, one, concluded it was a feasible project, but really difficult. And two, uh, we were split six to six, and the antis were fanatically against it. And uh, they were against it because of the big science representation. Big science will take all the resources from small science. So, And going out into the world, it was probably 80% of the biologists were opposed. And, I could give from the beginning all the arguments I can give now about why the genome was a good project. But it was exactly as Thomas Kuhn said, if you're biased about things, you don't hear what uh, other people uh, have to say. And of course, it took a National Academy report that unanimously endorsed the genome to get it started in, in uh, 1990 and finished in in a pretty good state by uh, 2003 or so. And of course, for me, what was exciting about the human genome was that it gave us a complete list of all the genes and by inference the proteins. So you could start thinking in a more global kind of systems way about human biology and, and about the biology of uh, other organisms whose uh, genomes were developed. And the third paradigm change that, that I was involved in also came from developing the sequencer because there it was really clear how, cross, how this cross-disciplinary group of people, engineering and especially chemistry, that was really key, and, and computer science and molecular biology were really important. And, uh, and so I started thinking more and more about that in the late 80s, I went to another president of uh, uh, Caltech and said, look, I'd like to start an applied biology department at Caltech. And I explained what that meant and why, if you could do that, then you can have biology drive relevant technologies for all of these hard problems. And uh, so the president said, well, that sounds like really a great idea. 
and the chemists and the engineers were enthusiastic. Physicists were probably indifferent. I never really figured that out. But, uh, but the biologists absolutely opposed it. So, so what made it possible to do the first Department of Molecular Biotechnology was Bill Gates, who gave the resources for us to move to the University of Washington and start that. We assembled a lot of absolutely spectacular people. And again, by now, the idea had become that biology would drive the technology. And that, in turn, could drive the development of the analytic tools so you could close the loop and, uh, and, and deal with information that was being generated uh, from new areas of uh, data space and so forth. But for the eight years of its existence, the, uh, the Department of Molecular Biotechnology, this first cross-disciplinary department, was spectacularly successful. So one, for genomics, Phil Green developed the two key pieces of software that everybody in the genome program used, one to assemble and one uh, an error uh, assessment process. We, we developed the inkjet uh, printer DNA synthesizer that uh, Agilent uh, has commercialized. And that allowed rays, but it allowed enormous amounts of DNA to be synthesized as well. Uh, in proteomics, we had Rudy Abersall pioneer the ICAT technology, which lets you quantitatively uh, compare lots and lots more proteins. And, and uh, John Yates developed the first uh, uh, software sequest for analyzing complex mass spec data. Uh, and this was just a newly emerging field. So these were first of the two key techniques in that area. Gerhard von den Ing, who you heard yesterday, developed a, a multi-parameter high-speed cell sorter of a new and uh, fascinating type. And then uh, this department actually had two of the 16 human genome centers, one run by Maynard Olson and the other uh, uh, run by myself. So it was spectacularly successful. But you know what uh, was uh, an interesting experience is the dean who hired me said after four years, he'd give me another floor of the building we were in, and we could put, we could build a systems biology department, institute, center, whatever it was, on top of the cross-disciplinary center. And that dean died in an avalanche in the Himalayas at year four. And uh, the next dean who came in had a very different uh, view of things. And he rescinded the new floor and everything and made things uh, uh, challenging, to say the least. So after, uh, after three years, I decided to resign. And fortunately, I had persuaded my two colleagues, Alan Derham, who you heard from, and Rudy Abersall to join with me in this endeavor. And I'll, I'll tell you, if you ever start new institutes, it's really key to have multiple first class senior people if you're to be legitimate and first class from the very beginning. And that was exactly the policy that uh, David Baltimore used to create the Whitehead Institute. He had himself and three other people that were ended up all being National Academy equivalents. And so, uh, so having Alan and uh, Rudy meant that we could recruit world-class people, junior, senior, from the very beginning. And it got the institute off to uh, a terrific start. And the idea was to kind of invent systems approaches to biology and then uh, later to uh, disease. And of course, it was there that uh, we actually developed the nanostring instrument that you heard about earlier today uh, from Roger, which was one of the first instruments that did single molecule analysis of uh, RNA molecules. And now Chris Lasted has actually taken that instrument beautifully further. So he's shown, one, that it can do beautiful ELISA assays that are very, very sensitive. And two, he's demonstrated that it's a great instrument for looking at single cell analyses. 
So um, what I think, from my point of view, the, the institute then opened up a whole new world of thinking about a systems approach to disease, and that led to systems medicine and this P4 medicine, predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. And, and of course, what was, what was really interesting is systems thinking started changing immediately our perceptions of how you think about disease. And I think, uh, looking at it back now, systems medicine has two really major uh, changes that come, came from systems thinking. So one is the idea that, you know, like the elephant in the earlier analogy, human beings are incredibly complicated, and we need to generate from them an enormous amount of information if we're going to be able to decipher their complexity and their dynamics and all of these other things. And we call this dense and dynamic uh, personalized data clouds. And what this is, is really a platform that lets you look both at wellness and at disease in entirely powerful uh, new ways. And I'll mention one example of that in just a moment. And the second thing, of course, was Systems biology brought a fundamental understanding of the importance of biological networks and the fact that they were the information pathways for medi mediating development, physiology, aging. And of course, when disease perturbed caused disease. And of course, if you could distinguish normal from disease perturbed networks that were relevant, you could, one, come to understand the basic pathophysiology of the disease, but two, you could really think in new ways about early diagnostics and, and ultimately about uh, therapeutics. So it was about 2006 or so with all of these insights that I really started thinking about, well, how can we bring these, this systems medicine, P4 medicine to the healthcare system? And then it, um, and then something happened that, again, thank goodness, I was at uh, a nonprofit research institute and not at a state university because I <clears throat> met the uh, Minister of Finance for the state of Luxembourg who had just decided to transform Luxembourg's economy from a 90% dependence on um, financial services to bring in uh, biotech and healthcare and so forth. And he asked us, he asked me to, if we'd write a grant to help them do this kind of thing. And we did write a grant and it um, did a bunch of things for Luxembourg that I won't talk about. But what it did for us is they agreed to pay us 100 million over uh, a period of five years, uh, 2008 to 2013 to develop the, the technologies and systems-driven strategies of, um, of systems medicine. So what this flexible money let us do was something we never could have done otherwise because many of the things we wanted to push were outlandish ideas that could never have been funded by NIH. And once we began to prove of principle, we had the money to drive through the development and maturation of the technology. So we developed a series of technologies and a series of systems-driven strategies, one of which was this idea of dense, dynamic, personalized uh, data clouds and so forth. And it was thinking about that that uh, in 2012, Nathan Price and I first proposed the way to take systems medicine, P4 medicine, to the healthcare system was to actually analyze 100,000 well people using these dense, dynamic, personalized clouds to uh, be able for each individual to analyze their information and identify the actionable possibilities that would either let them uh, optimize their, their wellness and or avoid disease. 
And of course, in 2014, we actually got 108 volunteer friends to go through this program. And we showed beautifully, one, that it worked for those individuals magnificently well. And two, we got this dense, dynamic, personalized data uh, for 108 individuals. It's been absolutely revolutionary in a, in a whole series of different ways. And it, these dense dynamic data clouds are really important because they let us, one, optimize human potential. They let us, in taking larger numbers, two, look at wellness to disease transitions, to get the transitions at the earliest period, to develop diagnostics and therapeutics that can do early reversal before there are any clinical symptoms. And in the future, this is going to be the essence of preventive medicine. But number three, the dense dynamic personalized data clouds are now letting us, and we're just getting started on this, take individuals who are sick and follow the progression of their disease, their response to therapy, and hopefully their migration back to wellness, and to do it with a dimensionality of data that lets us stratify patients in ways we could never, ever think about uh, doing before. So anyway, uh, this uh, success led to the creation of a company with, uh, with uh, Nathan Price and Clayton Lewis called Aravail, which did exactly what we did with the 108 pioneers uh, for uh, consumers. And uh, a measure of its success is it's been in operation six or seven months now, zero advertising. It has way more than 1,000 customers already in the uh, Seattle area. And by the end of this year, we think we'll have 10,000 dense dynamic personalized data clouds, 100 times as much data as we had initially. And ISP is in the unique position where we uh, will collaborate with Aerofail. Uh, to analyze uh, all of these data. And of course, I think it was these kinds of things that led us to the sixth and final paradigm change. Uh, Rod Hockman, who is the CEO of, of uh, Providence Hospital System here in Seattle, approached me about seven months ago and said, look, I've been thinking our system has grown. It's now, well, it's had mergers that, when complete, will it'll have 50 hospitals in seven states. It'll have about 4 million patients it sees annually. And it has access to perhaps 35 million records. So it just opens up an enormous number of possibilities for us. And we, on March 9th, uh, our successive boards uh, completed an affiliation agreement which lets ISB retain its name, its brand, its board, uh, and largely its independence to do things. Uh, and at the same time, it gives us the ability, I'm now chief science officer of the Providence system, to bring our translational thing, system, our translational ideas uh, to this system. And we already have four underway, scientific wellness, uh, cancer survivorship group, and we're going to do big projects on Alzheimer's and one form of inevitably fatal tumor, uh, glioblastoma. But I am convinced that we're going to have the opportunity to absolutely transform healthcare uh, over the next 10-year uh, period of time. And I think one of the most striking things is we're now in a position to be able to double our faculty from 9 to 20 over the next five years. And the people we could recruit are spectacular. And it's because Providence gives a lot of translationally oriented scientists a avenue that has just not been possible before. And I'll, I'll make one other point, again, that gets back to uh, bureaucracies. I spent the last eight years going to at least eight different academic medical centers, making proposals that were a small fraction of what we'll do with Providence. 
And in each case, there were people who were very enthusiastic. But there were always one or more who were negative. And in academia, as you know, the naysayers always went out over the yaysayers. And they were, they were negative because they were afraid of losing resources. And they were afraid their silos would be invaded by these kind of things. And what is marvelous about Providence is it doesn't have any of the arrogance of academic clinical centers. And I'm all about getting things done. And I think that's going to be really exciting. So let me just close by making uh, a couple of comments. In thinking back on my own career, I think what has really driven me and in my interest in technology has been successively clear visions about each of these paradigm changes that we talked about. And I can't say I had from the very beginning uh, the grand vision. But what was interesting is each vision led absolutely seamlessly uh, to the next vision in, uh, in a beautiful way. And I think what's really important in science is to be a problem solver who can get things done in spite of bureaucracies, in spite of regulatory agencies, and, and with funding. I, you know, my argument is, Look, if you're not going to get it from the government, go find it from some other place. There are people out there now that are really interested in innovative and novel ideas. And that's, that's how we and look at Luxembourg. I mean, Luxembourg would have never happened in the context of a state university. Uh, that I can tell you unequivocally. I think the, the other thing is, Working with superb people is absolutely incredible. I mean, the people that have been associated with me in my career are just, many are absolutely four plus, absolutely spectacular kinds of people. And they're people who could come into a complex environment, take on a problem, and solve it. And you didn't have to babysit them. And it was, it was, it was terrific. I think. Another point is, I think science is about having fun. And if I think you ever stop having fun in science, it's time to, to retire or go do something else. And, and, and the final point I'd made that, that has been fun for me is I remember Norton Simon once, uh, a, a famous industrialist in Pasadena that I knew when I was down there, once said to me, you know, most people's career is very much like a bell-shaped curve. You go up to a maximum, you fade away and go down to the bottom. And he said, but if you're willing somewhere near your maximum to change your objectives and goals and career orientation, you can have another bell-shaped curve again because you're insecure, you get excited, you start learning again. So my suggestion to the younger people and maybe to some of the older people is to change careers every 10 or 15 years. And I don't mean go from biology to theoretical physics, but I mean change your orientation in really fundamental in different ways. So anyway, thank you very much from my colleagues for those very kind words. And uh, I hope you can sense uh, some of the fun we're having here at ISB. Thank you.